So, you know, it's not about the trip, is it? It's about the destination. I dread flying all the way to Florida. Not that fun of a time. But I'm longing for the day that I get there. Is that how you feel about heaven? About when you meet Jesus face to face? Think about that as the Advent season's coming up. And think about that as, as we talk about Stephen today. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. For you are an awesome God worthy of all praise and honor. Lord, we thank you for your love rather than your condemnation. We thank you for the gift of eternal life rather than eternal death. We thank you that Jesus Christ came and bore our stripes, our, our sins upon his shoulders. And Lord, we thank you that his sacrifice was complete. Lord, help us to look at the example of Stephen and live a life where we long to see Jesus face to face, that we long for your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, give us kononia, fellowship through your spirit. Let us love one another as we love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for your spirit being upon us, Lord. And fill us with your spirit today. Teach us and guide us and equip us for the, for the trip that we have, knowing that the final destination is our eternal home with you. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I named this sermon continually, even until death. Because death is that transition where we actually see eternal life. And there's no better example from Scripture, in my opinion, than Stephen of what Jesus Christ was like on this earth. We talked about him last week and his appointing, and he's the next person that we're going to read about in the story. And Luke is telling a specific story you know, with, with great detail, just like a surgeon would. And we've got a lay person who was one that stood out, one that was full of spirit and wisdom, and he gets martyred for his faith. The suffering gets worse and worse and worse, and they, they, they can't stop this Jesus movement by killing Jesus. They can't stop it by threatening the, the disciples and, and uh, beating them, whipping them. They, instead, you know, they... they want to be counted worthy of suffering for Christ. So maybe if we just attack Joe in the church, maybe the church will just come tumbling down. But see, we're fully equipped by the Spirit of God so when that day comes upon us, we will have the words to say. We won't stand in fear, anything else, because we'll fear only the Lord and we have no condemnation in His sight if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Wow! Wow! There is nothing that men can do for uh, do to us. So I have to ask my question. Has to ask the question again: Is how much have I suffered for being like Christ? Because we live in a world where we're not suffering for Christ. But am I not suffering because I'm not enough like Christ, or am I just not suffering that much because I have an opportunity to proclaim the gospel message without so much of that suffering? Suffering is not. Bad health, calamities in your life. That's a result of living in a sinful world. And thank goodness that the light has come to the world, that, that God didn't take away the light. You can preach on heaven and hell all day long, but hell is an absence of anything that is from God. What would it be like if He abandoned us, if He was not faithful to us? And yes, He brings down the rain and the sunshine on the righteous and the unrighteous. It's what He does. Because it's His will that all men will turn to Him, turn away from their sinful ways and turn to Him and receive redemption through Jesus Christ. So how much are you like Christ in this world? Because if you are, you will suffer some. Even in this country, it may be ridicule, it may be loss of a job, it may be standing up for whatever and it costs you this. It may even get to the point in this country where it means that you don't, can't do certain things as a result. Who knows? Our, our freedom seem to be being attacked and we seem to be in the end of times and we read that from Scripture. But we ought to live as Christians that every day we're our last. That we proclaim Jesus Christ to the best of our ability by the way we live and what we profess in case we don't have an opportunity again. Just like Stephen. 
Do you think when he woke up that morning that he thought that would be his last day or he just woke up that morning and said, I've got a mission. I've got a calling. I'm going to feed the poor. It's what I've been given a chance to do and I'm going to do this with all my heart and I'm going to profess along the way. I don't think that day he got up and said, today's the last day I'm going to live. But I don't think that made any difference in how he lived his life because he professed Jesus Christ. The church gave themselves continually. What did they give themselves continually to? Constant, steadfast, persistent devotion. Well, we can review a little bit. In Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Continually. It's the same Greek word. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all of his brothers. In Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves continually to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Then just a couple of verses later, a few verses later, Acts 2 verse 46, every day they continued to meet. They continually met together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This is the pattern of the church. And then in Acts 6 verse 4, the, the apostle said, we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Constantly in prayer, constantly in ministering the word so that the church could be the hands and feet of Jesus, that they could do this food distribution program, this food distribution ministry, because that's what the word is. They could minister to the poor, the needy. They could be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, and that's exactly what Jesus did when he was here. The church lived like Jesus, and they proclaimed resurrection from the dead through Jesus. They proclaimed the full message of the gospel, all the words of this life, this way of life. And it included suffering. And we see as that suffering gets more and more intense, that the church gets more firm, more firm of a foundation. They... they trust God even more. They praise Him even more instead of saying, take this away from us. Not only do they pray for boldness, and I'm thinking that that's exactly what Stephen encounters. He's like, I remember when we prayed for boldness, and I'm so glad we did because I'm going to need it today, standing before the Sanhedrin and everything. So we saw different examples too, and we saw an example of Barnabas, and <laughs> Barnabas giving that laid it at the apostles' feet was actually what presented this problem, because they had the money and the funds, but they didn't have enough people to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. It was taking away from the ministry of the twelve, so they had to appoint men from among them. And they appointed Greeks, who actually were the ones kind of disgruntled at first that their widows were getting mistreated. But God works all these things out. In Acts 6, verse 8 to 15, it says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Not one of the twelve. This is Stephen. He's full of grace and power. Unmerited favor from God. Grace upon grace upon grace. And he has power. Because the Holy Spirit has come upon him. Not one of the twelve. Not one of the 120 that we know of. This is just a guy that we're reading about that's not encouraging, that was Barnabas, but a guy that was godly, like Jesus in this world. And he performed great wonders and signs among the people. And don't miss that, because so many times in our gospel presentation today, we say that those miracles were for just the, the apostles. Right here it says, Stephen performed great wonders and signs among the people. And that brought about jealousy and discord from others who did not want the way of Jesus being proclaimed. Another example of an ordinary, I use that term, person, not one of the twelve, living like Jesus. Being filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where it's running over where he's not worried about the things of this world and the Holy Spirit is transforming him and working powerfully through him. He was a man full of God's grace and power and he performed great and wondrous signs. So what's going to happen next? We're going to be attacked. The church is going to be attacked. We fight a spiritual battle. That's what happens. The more that you get on focus to God, the more Satan wants to tear you down and ruin that ministry. 
Don't be surprised. Suffering. Suffering like Jesus. Think about that for a second. All the things that Jesus was accused of, how he went silently before and how the, the religious were outraged and didn't want anything but to murder him. And this is exactly how they feel towards Stephen. They've already been warned by Gamaliel not to touch these apostles and that would mean their followers too and everything. But they're getting in such a rage where they want this man dead because of how he lives and what he proclaims. Why would you want someone dead who's performing many wonders and signs and how can you not see that is from God? An angel's already rescued the apostles from, from uh, prison and you know that didn't even come up in the conversation. How did you get out? And it's ironic because the Sanhedrin didn't believe, or I mean the uh, uh, Sadducees didn't believe in angels, but yet how can you explain their divine rescue? <laughs> and in just a few verses you're going to read where Stephen's face shone like an angel. How can they miss all these things and be so blinded except that you go further and further and further from the truth. Like we taught in Awana's last time we met, you know, when the children asked me, said, well, how could a brother ever kill a brother? Because we're at Cain and Abel. But the further that you get away from the God, the further you go down that path, and God warned him, do what is right. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of us, guiding us and leading us and transforming us. But every time we deny that, Every time we go our own way, are we getting further and further from the light? So again, I tell you to look at Stephen and, and the example that he is. But let me go back to Acts chapter 4 for just a minute and remind you what happened there. Verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats. This was just imprisonment. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That was their prayer. Don't take these things away from us. We don't understand them. We don't want them. But we're not asking you for to take, take them away. What we're asking you is for you to give us boldness that we need to take this mission to the people, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to proclaim the gospel message. Verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders, which we see even through Stephen, through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly, all of them. All of the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify, and they haven't let Satan distract them from it. That's why Stephen was appointed with the other men in the first place. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. I don't know how long this time period was from, from, th from that point to the day that Stephen is martyred, but I know what the Holy Spirit is doing in the life of him because it's here in Scripture. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy people among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. It was, and it was distributed to anyone who has need. Whatever time period has expired, whether it's been months or years, there's a need. The need is still there. There are needy people in this world, those that don't have, and the church is called to help them. That's one reason we did the food baskets. That's one reason we'll do the food baskets again for Christmas. And it's not necessarily, that's a different topic for a different day, but to judge them on who is needy or not. If there is a need, God calls you and I, the church, to try to meet that need. Not to be the judge of it, not to be hypocritical, not to tie anything with it, but to love. Because without loving like that, how can we understand God's grace that He would send His only Son, the advent of Jesus, and His return? Because we are all enemies of the cross. All, none of us righteous. No, not one. We deserve God's wrath. So are we going to be like Stephen, who is like Christ? Are we going to be like Barnabas who is encouraging and not worry about what's our own but give it freely? 
He didn't tie strings to it, anything else. He brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And obviously this pattern continued because it got so big that it was taking all the time of the apostles and they had to delegate it to the lay people to get them involved in ministry. If you ever get your feet dirty in ministry, and I don't mean that with dirty feeding the poor, but you, you go get busy, it's such a blessing that you serve because we are called to be servants. If you're not serving, how can God bless you in such a way? But will you cons consider being jailed, being beaten, or being martyred? Will you consider that a blessing? Will you take up your cross no matter what it is? Because you've got to deny yourself first. Will you take up your cross, whatever that instrument of suffering and death is, and will you follow Jesus? They put it at the apostles' feet and distributed it to anyone who had need. Verse 36, Joseph, here's our example, a Levite from Cyprus, from the apostles, uh, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I don't think that day Stephen said again, oh, you know, if Barnabas just wouldn't have sold his property and gave all this money, I wouldn't be in this predicament and I wouldn't be in, being persecuted today. No, I think he thought that it was a joy and a privilege to be like Jesus, to proclaim his name because there's no greater hope he remembers that glorious, glorious day when heaven came down. And we see that again in this, in this scripture coming up. When Jesus took all of his sin and all of his shame away, he saw the powerful signs and wonders and now he sees God even working through him so that he can be a light to the world, that he can be the feet of Jesus when Jesus is in heaven preparing a home for him. All of the church has this mindset. They want to proclaim the message. They ask for boldness to proclaim the message no matter what happens, but we're leading to martyrdom. You know, it's hard to see the big picture, isn't it, though? We want to complain. We want to groan. We want to moan instead of being thankful. Barry said it again. We have so much to be thankful for. But sometimes we just naturally want to say, woe is me, when we need to be thanking God, even in calamities, because He knows the big picture. Who of you here would not die to save your child? <laughs> but we don't know the big picture, do we? But God knows. He has everything in control. He is sovereign, and He has given you a privilege of being like Jesus in this world. Barnabas' life was encouraging, and Stephen's life as a martyr is something to look at strongly and how much he was like Jesus. In chapter 6, verse 9, opposition arose. However, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, here comes the opposition. We see a man full of God's grace and power. We see the mighty miracles he's performing, and opposition arose. It was from the synagogue of the freedmen, it was, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexander, Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. Who would think that an argument again would lead to murder? But let's go right back to the beginning. How could two brothers argue and then one murder the other? But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave Stephen. And the NIV says, as he spoke. It implies that the Spirit gave him these words of wisdom as he was willing to step out and be that testimony. Yes, they come from prayer. They come from reading God's Word. They come from, from being in fellowship with one another. But the Spirit gives you the words to say when you need them to say so don't be worried about what you're going to say that day because that's one of the biggest objections. I don't know what to say to this person and everything. Be willing to go. Be prayed up. Be full of the Spirit. And the Spirit will give you the words and the things to do when that time comes. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. I'm going to say again, that sounds just like Jesus, does it not? condemnation for, for saying something that he did not say whatsoever. Not seeing God's grace and power working in him, but being blind to it, filled with rage and jealousy. 
So they stirred up, verse 12, the people and the elders of the teachers and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses. Whoa, now we're getting really terrible. False witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Sounds exactly like Jesus being falsely accused. And what does Stephen do? Does he get up and say, your accusations are false, this is not right? Did Jesus do that? It's amazing to me, but it's so much God's character that Jesus never uttered a word. We, we want to fight so much for justice. That's just not right. And we especially want to when it's us. Those, those allegations you're making against me aren't right. And you know it. You know the good that I've done. But Stephen didn't have to do that. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't have to fight his battle because Jesus already fought his battle for him. And he knew whatever happened to him that day was in God's hands. And he gets to see heaven opened up and Jesus standing by the Father welcoming him home. Wow. Wow. Verse 15, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now we've got to go back. We're in the, the, in the uh, courtroom of all of the religious leaders, all the ones there that crucified Jesus. The rage and everything is there just the same. We've just had, like I said, a miraculous intervention where the disciples were... Uh, taken out of prison and got to come back and proclaim to the Sanhedrin. And we know that some even believe. And now Stephen's face shone like an angel. We've seen the things that he's done, the good things he's done. We've seen God's hand upon him, and all of a sudden he glows. Come on. <laughs> How far do you have to get away from the light to not see it shine at all? And I've got to put it right back to us. How much are we shining like Jesus? It had to remind them of Moses when he came down with the law. Moses, the one that interceded for God, bringing God to his people. The one that gave the holy standard that, that the, they have taken and manipulated and oppressed people with. The, the, the holy standard that they know they have not kept themselves, that they are hypocrites but you've gone so far away that you don't even have what we call conscience? How could this not be a telltale sign that this is from God? In Exodus 34, verse 29 to 35, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because that he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses his face was radiant, and they were afraid. They were afraid to even come near him. Instead, these religious leaders want to stone him. But Moses called to them, verse 31, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him and gave them all the commands that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, verse 35, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses put the veil back on over his face until he went to in to speak to the Lord. You know the religious leaders had to be remembering this. There's no record of anyone's face shining like an angel until this. This is a man given the Spirit of God to perform powerful miracles. God's grace and wisdom was upon him like none other besides the twelve, if you want to say that. So how could they deny that this was a messenger from God? How could they in their rage murder him? There's no reason for us to think that Stephen knew his face radiated either. He just went about his business. His business of being like Jesus. Today I got up, 
Today I'm going to go help with the food distribution, do my ministry. If I get a chance to talk about Jesus, I'm going to talk about him there. And if I get a chance to talk about him in front of the religious leaders, I'm going to talk about him there. My life is going to be Jesus. Because what else do I have in my life that is worth living for more than that? To tell people about the hope that I have. Why do we want to get distracted? Why do we want to put our hearts securely on other things? Why do we want to fret and worry about what we're going to wear or what we're going to eat? Why don't we let God be God and why don't we be like Jesus? Stephen is such a great example of that. And I'm not going to get into his sermon today. I'm just getting up to this point. And it may cost you for being a testimony. And it may not. A godly man falsely accused, silent to the accusations that are before him, but proudly, boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ. All the words of this life, this new life in Christ. Acts 7 verse 1. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? The religious people didn't care about the truth. And you may encounter that. There may be plenty that don't want to hear the truth. And Peter warns us not to force it upon them to live such good lives that when they do ask you of the hope that you have, be ready to say it. Be ready to proclaim. If anybody asks you about your grandkids and stuff again, you're happy to say, oh, let me show you a picture. Let me tell you about them. Are you not happy to tell them about Jesus? Do you ever worry about it again? What am I going to say exactly about, about my grandson or granddaughter? No, you don't worry about that. Why would you worry about what you're going to say about Jesus? He is my Savior and my Lord because He died for me. How can God love me so much that He did? I don't know, but I believe. Jesus Christ was a real man. He died. He rose again. No one found His body. He lived. He's, he's a historical fact. You examine, look at creation, whatever words you come up with that the Spirit gives you. But be proud to share about Jesus Christ, no matter what it costs you. Let me remind you again about the veil. When Jesus died, that temple veil was torn. This is big, huge. It's what separated God from man. We are His hands and feet. We don't need a veil over us anymore. We don't need it over our face. We don't need it over our heart. It's been removed because of what Jesus Christ has done. So He has called us to go and proclaim. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go proclaim. Make disciples to the utter end of the earth. That every tribe, tongue, and nation will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Another author wrote some words about that. We don't even know who this author is. The author of Hebrews in chapter 10 says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, be, it can never by the same sacrifices repeatedly, in, endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, He said this, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a, bold, but a body you prepared for Me. With burnt offerings and sin offering you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Stephen hadn't heard these words penned yet, but he, these words were in his heart. <clears throat> First he said, sacrifices and burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, a servant willing to do God's will. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus is our example. 
He is the one who, who paved the way. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, as the author of Hebrews goes on to say. In verse 11 from Hebrews 10, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for, for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And let me remind you, spoiler alert, Jesus is standing up to, to greet Stephen. <laughs> that is so awesome. Verse 13, And since that time he, awaits, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sin and lawless acts I will remember no more. So don't let that be something that holds you back either. Well, I used to do this. It doesn't matter. You're a new creation in Christ. Live like it and proclaim his word. <clears throat> and where, there has, where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some get in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received this knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know Him who said, now we get to hear the words of God. We had Jesus' words, the Holy Spirit's words, and now we have the words of God the Father, God the Creator. For we know Him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge His people. Stephen never heard these words, but you know these words were in his heart. Because he actually said to not hold that sin that they did killing him against them. Wow. He sounds like Jesus. It is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Remember those early days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution and other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and not delay. And... But my righteous one will live by faith. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we, we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. That's the example that Stephen is to me. You can go home and read his testimony, whatever you want to do. But I want you to think today as we go into communion about how your life is like Christ. You have the example of Jesus. You have the example of the disciples. And sometimes you say, I can't meet these expectations. But you know what Peter was like before he let the Spirit transform him. And here you've got a guy, just a guy. I don't mean to put that too hard. But he's one of the lay people in the church. He's one that just popped up from a pew and said, Here I am, Lord. Yes, 
I will answer the call. I will be like Jesus. I won't fear men. I will not be ashamed. I will not be afraid. For I know that the gospel is the message of salvation. I know that you've given me that responsibility and I will love and feed the poor. I will not consider the things you've given me to be used for my own good. I will help make things rich towards other people. The example of Stephen. <clears throat> As we come to communion, remember what Jesus told us. He said, this is my body given for you. He went silently before his accusers. He was falsely accused. He didn't care. He could have called a legion of angels down. But instead, he went silently because he wanted to save you and I. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now you, if you believe, have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You have the words of life in you, written on your mind and written on your heart. Are you living like Jesus? And he said, this is my blood poured out for you. You're not, you're not happy with the blood of bulls and goats. They'll never cleanse. But a sinless, spotless man dying in the place of a sinful, wretched man? Then that's called a ransom. My Lord ransomed me back into the heads of God. His body given for me and His blood given for me. Father in heaven, we just pray that Your blessing be upon these elements of communion. We know that, that this is just a representation of what Jesus has done for us. We know that the Advent season is, is just to help us remember the anticipation coming up to Christmas and the hope that we've been given. Lord, help us not to consider and concentrate on gifts or secular things, but to concentrate on the fact that you loved us so much that you would give your one and only Son, Emmanuel, God with us. May we heed to the words of life. May we walk by faith. May you grow our mustard seed faith. May you transform us through and through by your Spirit and give us fellowship with one another. Help us to love you with everything that we have and to love even our enemies. Father, we thank you for Jesus that he would give up heaven, that he would go silently before his accusers, that he would be put to all that shame and ridicule, and even more, that he would separate himself from you to bring us back to a right relationship with you. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen. Come as you want.